With this lesson, we're beginning a new unit of instruction on chemical equations. The previous unit of instruction was about chemical formulas, and in order to do well with chemical equations, you've got to understand what chemical formulas are and how to balance them. Now, there are a lot of principles in chemistry. We, some, most of them, we call them laws that are the reasons why we can balance chemical equations. But the one that's the most important for you to understand, uh, we're going to term the law of conservation of matter. Now, when Lavoisier first coined the law of conservation of matter, he didn't really understand what matter was. It took Newton to figure that out. But um, he, was just, he just figured out that, that mass wasn't lost in a chemical reaction. Okay? But now we call it the law of conservation of matter. Now, you probably know from earlier science classes that it's not really the law of conservation of matter in a broad sense anymore. It's the law of conservation of mass energy, okay, or matter energy. Um, it turns out, uh, Einstein figured this out, that uh, matter and energy are kind of the same thing. You can turn one into the other, and that's the famous E equals MC squared equation, okay, where we, that relates those two. But since in chemistry we primarily stick with uh, chemical reactions and we don't do a whole lot of nuclear reactions, um, law of conservation of matter, that, that half of it or that side of the equation matters to us. And as long as it is a, it is a chemical equation, law of conservation of matter still applies. So we're going to use it that way. So, so long as the only reaction taking place is chemical and not nuclear, And so long as we're only talking about a chemical reaction, matter is not created or destroyed. Therefore, the mass, since mass is a, a, a way of measuring the amount of matter, it's not defining matter, but it's a way of measuring the amount of matter, the mass of reactants in the chemical reaction will equal the mass of the products. And that's what Lavoisier figured out. Now, Lavoisier was a Frenchman. His name's on the Eiffel Tower. And he's the one that coined the term chemistry. Lavoisier had his head cut off in the French Revolution. Married a 14-year-old girl when he was in his 30s. Well, back then it was common, okay? That was, that was normal. All right, so... Um, and, and she was actually uh, really, really important to his research. She was kind of like his secretary for his research. Uh, wrote it all down. We have, we have her to thank, really, for the fact that we have records of all these things. Very important stuff. Uh, this, is, this is an unbalanced chemical equation. And it's unbalanced because in a sense, it violates the law of conservation of matter. Now, long after Lavoisier, and after a lot of other things were figured out about chemical reactions, Dalton came up with the first scientifically based theory of the atom. And Dalton, no, not that Dalton. Uh, not our Dalton. Uh, Dalton um, theorized that the reason that, in part, the reason that uh, equations can be balanced it has to do with the fact that we're not really changing uh, the basic units of matter here okay what we're doing is moving them around and that's what we see when we balance an equation we have H2 two atoms of hydrogen O2 two atoms of oxygen and moving them around to make water okay so you never lose any mass because you don't lose any atoms now, if you weighed it, that would be a different thing. You've got to understand the difference between weight and mass. Okay, You weigh more here than you do at Myrtle Beach. You, were, you thought you were telling to say the moon, didn't you? That's what everybody says, right? But in fact, you weigh more here than you do at Myrtle Beach because underneath here, the ground is more dense. We have a lot of granite underneath your feet. 
Okay? And so granite's more dense than the sand and, and uh, material that's under the beach. And so that has a greater, uh, that greater density uh, translates into a greater amount of granite. Very small now, hard to measure. But they know it's true. You can actually determine a lot about what's underneath the planet Earth by the gravity they measure. Okay? Um, I don't know how you measure gravity. I just know it can be done. I've read about it. It's all I know. All right? A gravitometer. I don't know. Okay. I just made that up. I don't know if it's right. All right. Um, so, you need to know the difference between mass and matter because if you're just trying to measure weight, you'll just get it wrong. Okay? If I run a chemical reaction and produce a gas, it looks like I've lost stuff. But in fact, the mass of that gas and everything else uh, fits into, uh, follows this law of conservation of matter. If we can determine the mass, we'd find we don't lose any mass in a chemical reaction. That's what Lavoisier did. He figured out the CO2 that people were breathing out actually had some mass. He didn't know exactly what it was, but he figured it all out. Okay? Um, so the way that we get a chemical equation balanced so that the number of atoms are the same on both sides is the process we're going you've already learned about. You've done it in in ninth grade. You balanced by inspection. We're going to use a different process in here. Um, but to balance this equation, you can't mess with the formulas. Okay? Once the formulas are balanced, you leave them alone. Got that? Once the formulas are balanced, you've got to leave them alone. Everybody with me on that? Okay? Because if you were to change the formulas, it wouldn't be water anymore. Be something else. And what we have is water. So we learned to balance formulas in the last unit. Once you balance the formulas, you leave them alone when you're balancing the equation. The only thing you use to balance the equation are coefficients out in front. And coefficients work a lot like the coefficients used in algebra. Okay? If I put a 2 here, and I will in a minute, it means I want to have 2 of everything that's there, including the 2 hydrogens. Okay? If we were to rewrite water as H O H and I put a 2 in front, that's pretty clearly four hydrogens, right? But don't confuse that. If I put a 2 here, that means I've got four hydrogens. All right? You with me? All right. The way we're going to balance this in this class is using a process called atom inventory. Now, for some of you, that's going to seem cumbersome because you're used to balancing by inspection, and frankly, it's a lot faster. The problem is that when you get the really complex equations, it's really hard to keep up with everything if you don't have an organizational system. So I'm going to require you to use an atom inventory in here. You got it? You're, going to, you're required when you balance an equation, or even when you're just showing me it is balanced, because I'm from Missouri, right? You've got to show me. So atom inventory is how you show me you know it's balanced. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to list the number of atoms vertically. All right? We're going to make a kind of oh, little mini spreadsheet thing going on here. All right. And then we're going to count the atoms on both sides, just like in an inventory in the store. You count stuff. So I can see that I have two hydrogen atoms over here. I'm going to put it there. And I have two oxygen atoms over here. Okay. And when I move it all around, let's ignore the two out in front right now. Okay. We had two hydrogen atoms here and one oxygen atom, okay? Got that? But when I look at this atom inventory, before I put that two there, I can see that things aren't balanced. And I need to have them balanced, because otherwise I'm violating the law of conservation of matter, and I know that to be reasonably true. Okay? So the way we do that is we use coefficients, like this two here. That two there means I now have not two hydrogens, but four. Not two oxygens, but two. Okay? Well, that unbalanced the other side, so to speak, or unbalanced the hydrogens. Now I need uh, a couple more hydrogens, so I'll put a two here. And that's going to give me four hydrogens. And then we're done. Okay? That's a balanced equation now. Everybody understand? So it's now your turn to practice. I want to give you a simple one. I know you could do it by inspection, but please use an atom inventory uh, to balance this equation, okay?
Okay, so I'll go through it with you now. I can see that I've got one nitrogen on the right and two on the left. The way that I'm going to fix that is to put a two in front of the compound that contains the nitrogen. And that means I'm going to have, now I'm not only changing the number of nitrogens, but I'm also changing the number of hydrogens. Now, I've been doing this a while, so I'm going to recommend that you do it the same way because, you know, I found this to work very well for most people when they do it this way. Once I put the coefficient there to change the number of one of those two atoms or any number of atoms in that formula, go ahead and mark out all of those atoms in your atom inventory. Okay, and then you can know you've got to go back and count them again. You, you, it helps you to keep up with what you've got to go back and count and you won't miss one. All right, so uh, now I see, uh, now, now I can see that I've got two nitrogens and I've got six hydrogens. All right. So I'm going to look up on this side and see, well, I don't have a hydrogen balance right now. So I need a three in front of this hydrogen to change that to a six. And now everything's balanced. Is that what you got? Good. Now while we're right here, let's, let's introduce you to something here uh, real, really quickly. Notice I put G... G and H, an L rather, next to this. And those are the physical state symbols. That tells me that's a gas, and that's a gas, and that's a liquid. Okay, so we're going to have to include physical state symbols. All right, they're going to become very important to predicting products when we get the double replacement reactions and, and predicting the products of double replacement reactions in this unit. So you should know that nitrogen is a gas. If you don't know, let me tell you, nitrogen is a gas, okay? And then hydrogen is a gas. And you should know that, all right? Because just, I mean, it's kind of like common knowledge for most people. But if you didn't know that, you know, you need to know it now. Nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine are all gases in their uh, pure state, okay? And ammonia. We talk about ammonia a lot in here, and we said it's a gas, right? One of the questions of the test had to do with it being a gas. Okay? You should know that ammonia is a gas. All right? So we've already talked about then L being the symbol for a liquid. Now, I recommend, in fact, I insist in here that you use a script L and not a, this, a you know, the printed symbol L. Because, you know, when you write this, I don't know if that's an L or if that's a capital letter I or if that's the number one. I don't know what it is, okay? So please, when you're writing the physical state symbol, use the script L instead, okay? Everybody with me? You understand why? Okay. I don't care whether the others are printed or not, but the L is kind of, that's kind of important. All right. So, um, all right, let's practice with one more. Let's, let's step it up a notch here, okay? All right, so this is AQ, and AQ stands for aqueous. We talked about aqueous in the last unit. It means dissolved in water. Okay, S is a physical state for sim symbol for solid. Okay, so that's all the four physical state symbols. You got gas, liquid, solid, and aqueous. Now, in, uh, and sometimes I've seen some textbooks where they list certain types of solids as CR to indicate it's a crystalline solid. We're not going to go there. We're just going to use solid, okay? So you have to be careful. You may have options in more than one place. Sometimes you can have other things in more than one place. Like you count them all, okay? All right, so uh, we can first see that silver is not balanced. I'm going to uh, put a coefficient of 2 in front of the species that contains the silver. And I'm going to go ahead and mark out the silver and the nitrogen and the oxygen because that reminds me i got to balance all three of those. Okay, so I can see now that I have two silvers, two nitrogens, and the number of oxygens I have is 2 times 3 or 6 plus 4, and that's 10. Okay? Now, um, there's a reason why we have pencils, guys. Okay? Use them. 
A lot of the time we'll get to really complex equations where keeping up with the number of elements is really complex, especially with hydrogens and oxygens. So don't be afraid to write down the math. I, I did that wrong anyway, didn't I? 6 plus 4 equals 10, right? You know, write it down because keeping up with it when there's a lot of it going on at one time is kind of hard. So use the space you got on either side of your added inventory to actually do the math. You got me? Make sense? Okay. Because if you choose not to and you make a mistake, well, that's on you now. Because I've kind of given you a tool for fixing that. I won't, I'm going to grade your item inventory. I will not be grading your um, math that you put on the right or the left. Okay? All right. Let's try this, uh, this one here. Let's see. Let's do C3 H8. That's a gas. And O2. That's a gas. And water. This is going to be a gas because this is a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions create a lot of heat, and heat boils water. And then CO2. Anytime you have a combustion reaction in this class, you can always reasonably assume water will be a gas. In fact, it's expected that you want, you're going to do that. Okay, every time you're going to say water is a gas, and you're going to assume something else that is not always true, and that is that we're going to produce CO2. Uh, in reality, if you sort of limit the amount of oxygen available, you can make carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. But we're going to, in this class, assume it's atmospheric oxygen. Um, at atmospheric pressures, and all the conditions are right to completely combust all the um, uh, hydrocarbon fuel so that we get CO2 every time. All right, let's run through this. I think that uh, doing combustion equations in the springtime makes a lot of sense because it just kind of fits with the sneezing season. I'll get it. No, sad joke, I know. All right, here we go. Got three carbons to start with, eight oxygens, I mean eight uh, hydrogens, two oxygens. Over here, turns out it's always one, two, three. All right, so I see that I've got three carbons on the left to get three carbons on the right. I need a coefficient three in front of the species contain, containing the carbon. Okay, I can't change the formula. I've got to use only coefficients to multiply the whole formula by the number I need. So that's going to change the number of carbons and oxygens. Always mark those through to remind you you've got to go back and balance them. So now I've got three carbons, and I want to use some space over here that I've got available to uh, add up the number of oxygens just to kind of keep up with things. So I've got one oxygen here plus three times two, or six here. So that's seven oxygens I have at the moment. Okay. Now I want to balance the number of hydrogens. I can see I've got eight on the left and only two on the right. To get to eight on the right, I need a coefficient four in front of the water. Okay, that's going to change the number of hydrogens and the number of oxygens. And I can see that I now have eight hydrogens, and I want to add up the number of oxygens. So four times one gives me four oxygens. 3 times 2 is 6. That gives me 10 oxygens. Okay? And now it's pretty easy to see that a coefficient 5 in front of the O2 is going to give me the number of oxygens I need to balance the equation. Okay? Make sense? All right. Now, <clears throat> let's try this one. C2H6. This is also a combustion reaction. So we're going to have water in gaseous form because we're creating a lot of heat. <clears throat> What's the name of this chemical right here? C2H6? Come on, we just finished the unit where you learned the name chemical. C2H6. Not propane. Two carbons. Ethane. Ethane. What's this one called? Three carbons. 
propane. All right, let's see how we do here. There's the sneeze. Here's the mini section of the spreadsheet. Count the carbons, two. Count the hydrogens, six. Count the oxygens, two. Over here, it's one, two, three. Do the atom inventory. Uh, well, using the atom inventory, then we're going to balance everything out. We know we have two carbons on the left. We only got one on the right. We want to have two, so we put a coefficient two in front of the species containing the carbon. That changes the number of carbons and oxygens, giving us now two carbons. And we've got one oxygen here. Two times two is four, and four oxygens there. That's a total of five oxygens. Got to balance the hydrogens. We've got six here and two here. We get six hydrogens. I need a coefficient three in front of the species containing hydrogen. That's going to change the number of hydrogens and oxygens. So I've got six hydrogens now. We're going to add up all of our oxygens again. Three times one is three. Two times two is four. That's seven oxygens. Okay? All right, everything's balanced except oxygen. When you run up against this, and some of you probably may have figured this out, when you run up against a situation such as this, We've got an odd number of oxygens on one side and an even number on the other, particularly when you have O2, where the, the only way you can balance the oxygens is to have an even number because that subscript 2 cannot be changed. Remember, once you have the formulas written, you can't change the formulas. So we have to keep that subscript 2. So no, no matter what we do, we have to have an even number of oxygens in this equation to get everything balanced. And you fix that very simply. Multiply everything except the coefficient in front of oxygen by 2. So I put a 2 here. Change this to a 6. Change this to a 4. And go and balance everything all over again. So now I have 4 carbons here. And 2 times 6 is 12 hydrogens. I didn't change the oxygen, so that's why I didn't mark it out here. Over here, I have 6 times two hydrogens, that's 12. Um, the number of carbons I've got is four. <clears throat> the number of oxygens I've got, let's see, it's six times one, that's six. Four times two is eight, that's 14 oxygens. Well, now it's easy to balance the oxygen because a 7 here will get it done. All right? Does that make sense? So here's the, here's the trick. It's not really a trick. Just a helpful tip. If you run up against a situation where you've got an uneven number, an odd number of oxygens on one side, this usually happens on the right side, and an even number of oxygens on the left because of an O2, then multiply all the coefficients except the one in front of oxygen by two and finish the process. Got that? While I'm here, let me give you a couple other tips. Always balance oxygen last. Always balance oxygen last. It's not necessary to list it last in your atom inventory, but always balance it last. Save it for last, okay? Kind of like saving the best part of your lunch to eat last, right? You know, maybe you like the, the mashed potatoes more than you like the meatloaf, okay? You eat your mashed potatoes last, okay? Save the oxygen for last, okay? Another little tip is hydrogen should be balanced next to last. Hydrogen should be balanced next to last, okay? So get everything balanced except the oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen next to last, oxygen last. Okay? From time to time, that's going to be a real helpful hip tip. I'm not, very, not sure how helpful a hip it is, but it's a good helpful tip. Okay? We've looked at several kinds of equations here. 
And the first two equations I showed you, this one here and this one here, fit into a category called synthesis. And the definition, or you could say the definition of a synthesis reaction is, anytime I take smaller chemicals and combine them into a larger chemical, that's synthesis. If you want to write down a definition to help you remember how to classify these, then the definition of synthesis is when you combine smaller chemicals into larger chemicals. That's synthesis. <clears throat> so our example for a synthesis reaction I'm going to use is this one. Synthesis. <clears throat> now, one of the demonstrations I did in this class was to take some salt and put it in a sample of water and run electricity through it. And if you do that, you can reverse this reaction. And so a synthesis reaction in reverse, where you take two smaller chemicals, I'm sorry, one larger chemical and, and, and break them apart into smaller chemicals. It can be two or three or four. I take a larger chemical and break it up, break it up into smaller chemicals. That's called decomposition. decomposition, breaking up a larger chemical into smaller chemicals. Okay? Now, an equation uh, that we haven't given you an example of so far, or I haven't given you an example of far, is called that's called single replacement. I'll give you an example now for a single replacement reaction. What now? Right here? Because Okay. I separated the hydrogen from the oxygen. I didn't break it apart into H2 and just O. Because oxygen doesn't like to be by itself, and, in, and in, in nature, oxygen is typically O2. Okay. Although we do have some in the higher atmospheres called O3, okay. one of the allotropes of oxygen. Okay. All right. So we're going to put zinc together with hydrochloric acid, and when we do that. We'll get hydrogen gas. All right, so look carefully, guys. Look carefully. This zinc on the left is by itself, but over here it's not. Okay? It joined up with the back of what's in this formula here, this, this chemical here. So the zinc can be thought of as displacing the hydrogen, kicking it out. All right? Zinc displaced the hydrogen, joined up with the chlorine, and hydrogen is by itself. It doesn't have to be hydrogen the atom, but it has to be hydrogen by itself. 
So that's called single displacement. Now I prefer the term displacement, although sometimes you'll see it written as single replacement. I won't count it wrong if you say single replacement, but I prefer the term displacement. Yeah? You're right. It's not. I haven't balanced it yet. Okay. So how would we balance it? That would fix it. Okay. Single displacement occurs when an element that's by itself replaces an element in a compound or displaces an element in a compound. <clears throat> the reality is it's a lot more complex than that, but that's what we think about it in high school chemistry. Okay? Got all that? Now, when you get to AP chemistry or to college chemistry, you'll find out that equations like this actually fit into more than one category. There's not just one classification for this reaction. This, ha this happens to be uh, single displacement, and it happens to also be redox, oxidation reduction. Okay, We won't get into that in the first semester of high school chemistry, but you do get into it in AP chemistry quite a bit. Okay, But that's, that's an example of single displacement. All right, now we did an example already we're balancing equations of uh, what's called a double replacement reaction and this one right here is a double replacement reaction okay in a double replacement reaction the front part of this chemical right here replaces the front part of this one and so we end up with silver and sulfate silver and sulfate okay but also at the same time the front part of this chemical ends up with the back of this one so they're kind of both displacing, and that's why we call it double displacement or double replacement. Very rarely is it called double displacement. Please call it double replacement, okay? I would accept displacement or replacement for single, but double, please use replacement. It's far more commonly called replacement. I don't need a parenthesis there. Don't know why I did that. Let's take that parenthesis off of that. Kind of sloppy there, but that's a sub two over there and an AQ at the end, okay? Is that a three? Where? Yep, that's NO3. Same equation that I wrote earlier. Okay, this is an example of double replacement. Is that SO4 after AQ? Yes, it's SO4. I understand, but if you'll stop talking, you probably hear. Yeah. The silver is going over and replacing the copper with the sulfate. 
the copper is over, over here and replacing the silver on the nitrate. So silver now is joined up with the back of this to make silver sulfate. Copper is now joined, copper is now joined up with the nitrate to make copper nitrate. Actually, copper to nitrate. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, uh, the next classification is really two classifications in one. It's a subcategory of double replacement. So it's an acid base and double replacement reaction. And you have to label it or classify it as both. So here's a side note for you, it'll help you. Strong bases always have an OH or a hydroxide ion. Strong bases always have a hydroxide ion. Okay? We talked about in the last unit that ammonia is a weak base. It's a weak base. Okay? It doesn't have an OH in it. It creates OHs through a, another reaction that we talked about before. But Strong bases always have the OH as part of the formula. Okay? So this is a strong base. This is an acid. You know it's an acid because it has hydrogen on the front. We name this hydrogen chloride and then change the name of the acid to hydrochloric acid. And what happens is we have a double replacement reaction. The hydrogen goes over here and kicks out the sodium and joins up with the OH. So now we get HOH. The sodium goes over here and sort of kicks out the H, and we get NaCl. Okay, so this is called double replacement, but it's also called acid base, or you could use the term neutralization. What's happening here is the acid and base are neutralizing each other. So salt water, that's not so harmful like acids and bases, right? So that's why we call it neutralization. At least at this point in time, at this point in the semester, that's why we call it neutralization. So this is both. And you have to be able to classify it as both, both double replacement and acid base or neutralization. Okay? So acids you know already, bases I just told you about. Yes. What? Mm -hmm. Strong acids and bases are always going to produce water and some kind of salt. Strong acids and bases, when reacted together, are always going to produce water and some kind of salt. Okay? It neutralizes it. It doesn't make it neutral. The neutral, being neutral, would depend on the amount of the acid in the base. But it does neutralize it. Okay. Um, yeah, those terms are not, you know, interchangeable. Okay. It's kind of like, since you're in JROTC, neutralizing a threat. Okay. Uh, you can completely eliminate the threat which would completely neutralize it, right? Okay. But if you only like, you know, killed a few people and the rest of them ran off to fight another day, well, that's not completely neutralizing it. Okay. That's kind of like the same thing. Okay. Make sense? All right. So this is an example of the type of combustion reaction we'll be working with in here. Okay, Combustion, in its larger definition, 
is any time you react a chemical with oxygen, I'm reacting this chemical with oxygen, and in addition to physical products, we also produce light and heat. We don't show the light and heat in this kind of equation. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. For balancing equations and classifying, we typically don't. Um, but anytime you react a fuel with oxygen, some kind of chemical with oxygen, and you produce light and heat in addition to physical products, that's considered combustion. This are the typical products of a combustion reaction when you have a hydrocarbon fuel. Anytime in this class we are going to show equations where we have a hydrocarbon fuel, and it's called a hydrocarbon because it's got hydrogen and carbon, a hydrocarbon fuel reacting with oxygen, we in this class are going to always show the production of water and CO2. Even though, in reality, if you limit the amount of oxygen, you can produce carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. Okay? That's why it's really important to make sure your car is running properly and your heating system, if you have natural gas, for example, is running properly. Because if you get carbon monoxide, you know, that's poisonous. That's not good. All right? So this is our typical sort of combustion reaction. An example of a combustion reaction. Okay, we're always going to produce water and CO2. Now, so far, I've only asked you to classify equations. Okay, later in this unit, we'll be predicting the products of three of these kinds of equations. Okay, so far, we're just classifying equations. Later in this unit, you'll be having to uh, predict the products of single displacement, double replacement, and acid base and combustion. Okay? And we have to have some more tools to do that. And I'll show you those short a little bit later. Maybe not today. Some of it I'll show you today. Okay? So you will you won't have to predict the products of decomposition or synthesis. You have to classify those kinds of equations. But single displacement, double replacement, double replacement, acid base, and combustion, you have to not only be able to figure out what kind of a react equation it is, only starting with the reactants, okay, only the left side, and you also have to predict what's going to happen on the right side. Okay? You with me? All right, that's just a sort of a, okay, here's what's going to happen in the future. Right now, I want to practice a little bit with, with classifying equations. I've given you definitions. We're going to practice a little bit. Okay, let's sort of take these one at a time here. Well, we're just, right now we're just trying to classify. There will be good practice for you to balance. Right now we're just classifying, okay? All right, Tanner, classify this equation, please. Okay, double displacement. Would everybody agree with that, or do y'all disagree? Anybody disagree? I don't hear anybody say anything. That's not. Agree. Good. Good. I like to hear it. You know, I like to know what you're saying, what you're thinking. All right. Okay. Julia, classify this equation, please. Be the final friend? Huh? It'd be synthesis. You're very, you're correct. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Haley, classify this equation right here. Double replacement. The strontium is going over here and kicking out the sodium, joining up with the sulfate. We got strontium sulfate. The sodium is going over here and kicking out the strontium, joining up with the chlorine, making sodium chloride. Double displacement. Nicely done. Okay. Is it uh, double replacement, single displacement. That's what I prefer. Well, I'll accept single replacement. I won't accept double di uh, re double displacement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Single so single replacement or displacement is fine. I prefer displacement. Okay. Single replacement or displacement is fine. I prefer displacement. Okay. While I have seen uh, double 
replacement described as displacement. That is not going to be acceptable in this class. I want you to call it double replacement. Okay? Got it? So single displacement, double replacement is preferred. All right. So, Katie, classify this equation. Which one is it? Number four? Yeah, the one I'm showing here. Yep. Three. Synthesis. Okay. Anybody disagree? Colin. Double replacement. Would anybody agree or disagree? Nobody knows. Agreed, somebody said. Okay, we got one vote for agreed. Shout it out, guys. Agreed. Uh, thank you. Good. All right, let's see. Jenny, classify this equation. You knew I was going to call you? Are you, you, are you, are you, uh, what was it when you see the future? What is that called? Psychic? Are you psychic? Okay. All right. Decomposition. Good. Huh? You know, in World War One, there was a plane called the Flying Jenny. You knew that? You didn't know that? Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, Austin, classify this equation. Single displacement. Would anybody disagree? Good. Oh, let's see. How about Andrew? Combustion, he says. Any disagreements? Huh? Number eight. Combustion. Okay. What? They said combustion, not acid base. Okay. Now, that is that is important, okay? I have students who'll see that water over there and say, Oh, that's acid base. It's not. Not all reactions that produce water are going to be acid base. Okay? All right. Which brings us to the next equation. Okay? You can't see it all. I got off the screen. Sorry. Surgeon, what's this one going to be called? Acid. Acid base. You've got to classify it both ways. Double replacement and acid base, or you could say double replacement and neutralization. Okay, that's fine. All right. So I've got a strong base over here, or at least, well, we'll call it a strong base right now. Later in the in the semester, we'll identify what are actually strong bases. But we know that all bases that are strong have to have hydroxides. Okay, in the formula, and we've got an acid. We know that because of the hydrogen in the front. Acids are named like ionic compounds. Hydrogen sulfate, then change to reflect the acid name. And so when you have a polyatomic ion as the anion, the hydrogen name gets dropped altogether, and eight gets changed to ic, sulfuric acid. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Let's see here. Taylor. What? Get ten. Double replacement. Anybody disagree? Anybody agree? Yes. Well, that was sad. No, it's actually double replacement. To be acid base, you have to have a hydrogen here. Okay? See, so this is a base, absolutely, but not an acid. Got it? You got to have hydrogen on the front for a non organic acid. Okay? All right. So, Dalton? Tell them what this is going to be. It is combustion. Not one so bad. I don't know what you're afraid of. <laughs> Not so bad. Not so bad. Okay. Oh, let's do Samir. What do you think? Synthesis, he says. How many of you agree? Raise your hand. All right. I see a lot of agreement. I see some people who either don't know or aren't paying attention. What? You agree with yourself? Okay. All right. Audrey, what kind of equation is this? Yeah, number 13. Single replacement. Very good. Very good. All right. Catherine. 
What do y'all think? Is she right? That was kind of sad, but yes, she's right. All right. I know I'm trying to get it back up on the screen. Just be patient. Kind of got stuck a bit. Let's see. Was that the last one? That's the last one. Hmm. Who am I going to call on here? Uh, Ashley. Single displacement. Very good. Now look, guys. This single displacement is a little bit different than the last one. Okay. In the last one I showed you, we had some a metal displacing hydrogen. And most of the time, metals displace metals. But metals can also displace hydrogen. But this is a different kind of single displacement where a halogen displaces a halogen. Okay? A halogen displaces a halogen. Okay? Column 7A of the periodic table are the halogens. All right? They're also numbered as column 17. All right? Y'all got that? Any questions about classifying equations? All right. So, <clears throat> we said that you're going to have to start predicting products. Okay? Predicting products of chemical equations requires some additional tools. And we want to use the right tools. Because using the wrong tools usually doesn't end too well. Okay? Imagine trying to hammer nails with your head. Uh, they might do that in some kind of karate demonstration, but it's not really a good practice. Okay? All right. So the tools you're going to need for predicting the products of reactions are the solubility rules and the activity series. Now, there's actually two activity series. Let me raise this up just a bit here. There's an activity series for metals and an activity series for halogens. Okay? Now, the activity series of metals you need to know, and it's not a reference you're going to have on the test. However, the activity series of metals can be inferred using a different reference. And I'm going to show you how to do this. We'll practice with this probably a little bit tomorrow once I find it. You can infer the activity series of metals and halogens from this standard reduction potential chart. Okay? Standard reduction potentials. All right? Let's take a look real quick at the comparison. Let's find something up here at the top, like lithium and rubidium. Let's just kind of keep those in mind, okay? And the, let me explain how this works. Activity series is only used in single replacement reactions. The activity series is only used in single displacement reactions. Got that? Activity series is only used in single displacement reactions. So, you have to be able to classify the equation before you know what to do, you, whether to use this or not. You got that? All right. So, knowing that, let's look at the top here. Lithium and rubidium. All right, let's go over here now to the... Uh, reduction potentials chart and see if you can find lithium and rubidium anywhere on here. Huh? Yeah, they are there. Both of them are there. Okay. All right. Well, so you got your own, right? Why don't you look? What? Why did I give you those tools? Golly. You sound like he's trying to, you know, tighten a, a nut with his hands here instead of using a wrench. Huh? Yeah, but that's not very tight, is it? Okay, all right. Yeah, all right, look. <clears throat> Everything that's on here can be found on the reduction potentials chart. But everything on the reduction potentials chart isn't found here. So when there's some things from here you kind of got to memorize, most of what you need you can find by using this, and then you will be given this on the test. Okay? So, the direction here is the opposite of the direction here. So, rubidium and lithium are at the bottom of this one, whereas they're on the top of this one. Now, what does it mean? Here's what it means. 
if I have a single replacement reaction, lithium will replace anything below it. If I have a single replacement reaction, lithium will replace anything below it. Got that? If it's higher on the activity series, it will displace anything lower on the activity series. If it's higher on the activity series, it will replace anything lower on the activity series. So potassium, the metal, will replace magnesium, the ion. So the first column here is the actual metal that, will, that, that you put in the reaction that's by itself and it replaces some part of the compound. Here's the part of the compound. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's find, all ago we, ran, we showed you, I showed you a reaction between zinc and hydrochloric acid. Remember that one? Yes? No? Maybe? There it is. Okay. Zinc replaced the hydrogen in the acid, right? Zinc, the metal, replaced hydrogen in the acid. So we've got hydrogen by itself and zinc chloride over here. All right. Zinc is higher than hydrogen in the acid. There's the hydrogen ion in an acid. Does that make sense? Zinc is here. Here's the hydrogen ion there as it would appear in the formula of an acid. Does that make sense? So you can actually find hydrogen on that list. Once I find the list. So zinc should be down here near the, near the bottom, or a little below anyway, the hydrogen. There's the zinc. Okay? And there's your hydrogen ion. See that? It's below the hydrogen ion. You with me? So you can infer most of the information that you're going to need from this reduction potentials chart. It's just the order is just reversed. Got it? Now, here's some things that aren't on this chart that you just got to know. We'll find the activity series again. <clears throat> While all the metals that are above the hydrogen here will displace hydrogen in an acid. So if I put chromium metal in an acid, the chromium will kick out the hydrogen ion and make hydrogen gas. There's the H2, okay? While all those above will do that, um, metals that are in this category right here, see how I've got a line here and a line here? If you tilt this around this way, it tells you these elements will not only react with an acid, they'll react with steam to form hydrogen gas. So these metals here treat water like an acid as long as the acid, as long as the water is in gaseous form. You with me? These metals right here will treat water just like an acid as long as, as, long as water is in gaseous form. Okay? Um, trying to remember now that there was a, a, this sort of process was discovered. I can't remember the name of it. That's the irons right here. Okay. So when they were, they used to make um, rifle barrels, or not rifle barrels, but. Um, Kentucky long rifles, what are those? Those are flintlocks, okay? By having to drill out and, and the barrels themselves, okay? And what they discovered was when they, these barrels would get really hot from drilling them out, and if they put water down that barrel, they get hydrogen gas and it would explode. Okay? Really kind of, you know, dangerous way to learn something like that, right? But that's, I think that's how they figured that out, or at least they began the process of figuring it out. Now, these metals up here, they don't just react with water in steam form. They react with water, period. Okay? So if I put barium in water, it's going to form hydrogen gas. This actually kind of explodes. Okay? If I put any of these metals in just plain water, I can get... An explosion if it's if I have a large enough sample of sodium. 
or potassium or rubidium. In fact, you don't put rubidium in water. Well, yeah, I mean, rubidium is just way too reactive. I wouldn't even show that as a demonstration in class. Maybe I'll show you potassium and sodium or something, okay? Got that? So, guess what, guys? Water is an acid. Under the right conditions, water is an acid. It behaves just like an acid, okay? So, even tin and nickel will react with an acid to produce hydrogen gas. These metals up here will react with water in exactly the same way. This makes water an acid. Okay, sometimes in the right conditions, water is an acid. Now, that's for single replacement reactions only, and we'll practice with some of those tomorrow, and that's what the lab is about. We're going to do probably on Wednesday, so you get a chance to practice those tomorrow. In the meantime, let's talk about the solubility rules. Those are necessary for understanding about double replacement reactions. All right, <clears throat> solubility rules. When we use the term solubility rules, it's like it's an absolute when it's not an absolute. Okay? Um, there are relative things and there are absolute things. Are things that rules that are absolute and rules that are relative. Um, one of the examples we might use would be thou shalt not kill. Y'all heard that before? That's a relative rule because we all know that under certain circumstances, killing is allowed. Yes? Mm -hmm. If you're in war, <laughs> you you got to kill or be killed, right? And that's also true with somebody who's breaking into your house with threatening you with bodily harm. Okay, You're allowed to kill them if there's a reasonable, reasonable belief in uh, your being threatened. Okay, And different states have different rules about that. So thou shalt, when you put it in terms of thou shalt not kill, that's a relative rule. If we change that a little bit and say, thou shalt not murder, well, that's an absolute rule. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, now. Well, not so much vague, but it's... There's room for some exceptions, okay? Well, when it comes to solubilities, there are some of these rules that are pretty much absolute. This first one right here, that's pretty much absolute, okay? But there's relative stuff as you go further down. But all of them, in a sense, are relative, in, the, in this sense. If I put enough acetate compound, say sodium acetate, in a solution, eventually I'll have enough in there that all of it won't dissolve anymore. Does that make sense? So it's not like no matter how much sodium acetate I put in a sample of water, it'll all dissolve. That's not going to happen. Okay? But, it, but on the whole, there, and there's actually a measurement for this. We don't need to get into it right now, okay? There's actually a measurement for how much is soluble, okay? So much percentage is soluble and so much percentage is considered insoluble. So it's all relative here. That makes sense? All right, so while it is true that sodium chloride is soluble and silver chloride for the most part is not soluble because that's an exception over here, silver chloride will dissolve a little bit, but not very much. Sodium chloride will dissolve a lot. So when you memorize these, you've got to keep in mind the exceptions are just as important as the rule. Got that? Any questions about solubility rules? Okay, so for the most part, the largest percentage of time, the largest percentage of conditions, these are all soluble with these exceptions over on the right. Down here, these compounds are largely insoluble, but there are always exceptions. Carbonates are insoluble, but sodium carbonate is not because sodium carbonate is in group 1. And guess what? Sodium carbonate is covered up here. Okay, group 1 salts. Got that? So there's some crossover here. But remember tonight, just for the first night, Memorize the first half of these.